the wave, the storm, the tsunami will come big time. In the next two, three, five years, we will barely recognize our daily way of using technology. It's about to be completely turned upside down. <laughs> Action. Welcome to the spirit of yoga. We are Kirsten and Burka from the Akasha Yoga Academy. In today's podcast, we're exploring the topic of expansion. And in today's tea chat, we have a very specific twist on the topic. We'll be talking about AI, artificial intelligence. And I'd like to introduce Burkert in a brand new unknown suit to you. He is not only a yoga meditation teacher and a business owner, but he is also an AI expert. So today um, we'll explore the benefit, the danger, the potential of artificial intelligence. Burkert. Let's start. What is an artificial intelligence? It is in everybody's mouth and head and in the news. What, what is it? What do we talk about? Artificial intelligence historically has been around actually already for decades and uh, started already with fantasies and dreams in the early days, 1940s, 50s, but already 1960s, 70s, the field of machine learning was picking up. They just had ideas about it, but the um, technological possibilities were not really there. The features were not available, but the first theories in the field of IT were being discovered in these early days. Um, and then it got supercharged in the 1990s and then in the early 2000s, uh, where um, the company called DeepMind, which later got acquired by Google under the lead of Demis Hassabis and Mustafa Suleiman, um, were um, having the first uh, success not only in chess, uh, which was also uh, pioneered by IBM in the early days, but in this uh, Asian board game known as Go, uh, which is an ultra complex with so many possibilities board game. Um, and AlphaGo was DeepMind's first uh, approach to beat a human being in this impossibly complex strategy game. And later on, what they discovered is um, that they could train this artificial game player without giving it any rules. They didn't train it, but just uh, giving it um, the rules and it was playing against itself. And it got so good that it didn't only beat the human player, but even the previous version of it. So this was kind of the the birth of the huge excitement uh, in artificial intelligence because it was clear these machines in these very specialized narrow fields can outperform humans even in complex tasks. And then over the last years, what picked up more and more uh, is um, the large language models, which are in a way a subfield uh, of this machine learning and this uh, general space of artificial intelligence. And um, over the last years already, there have been strong progress made uh, specifically by a very famous company, OpenAI, with their models of uh, GPT-1, GPT-2, uh, already many years ago. Um, GPT-3.5 was already a big breakthrough in the expert world. And people saw like, whoa, this is completely next level. And then it was published, as uh, most of us know by now, uh, end of November 2022, uh, the chat GPT uh, went viral, uh, spread around the globe like a wildfire faster than any other previous software and caught the, not only the tech world, but also the tech excited public by storm um, and kicked off a whole debate also about uh, the dangers and potentials of this technology. In the meantime, also various other more visual-based technologies were unfolding for image generation, uh, voice recognition, voice generation, and others. Um, so the field is moving at a breakneck speed. At extremely accelerated rates, the progress is unfolding. Thank you for this short overview. Like, 
I wasn't aware that AI is actually that old already um, having its root in the 1990s. And uh, I remember these times that um, people started playing jazz with their computer. Chess and, computers uh, was in the old days. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, that's basically already, of course, AI at work in a very fun form. Um, but by now it became really big in a way that it creates a lot of excitement, but also a lot of fear in, or in a way that doesn't only outrule basically your chess partner, but it might outrule humans in a bigger way. Support on one hand, um, supercharge, but on the other hand, also outrule. I think that is uh, where the big danger comes from. And um, I'd like to hear from you as you're really so fully on the forefront of the development. What's the problem? What's the danger? Like what is realistically the danger? And, uh, and what, what, do we, what do we deal with? Yeah, one of the most common fears uh, in the public perception of AI and also in the expert anticipation, both uh, foresee the risk of job loss. Mm -hmm. Because the artificial intelligence is becoming not only more capable, but of course also more cost effective. Because the machine right. can, depending on the circumstance, more or less work 24-7, uh, whereas the human uh, worker only gives eight hours of the 24 hours and needs holidays and needs healthcare and whatever mm -hmm. other social security tax benefits. So um, the machine just not only by quality of output, but then also by quantity of repetition, iteration, uh, can in many tasks already now outperform human beings uh, quite strongly. Uh, Which task do you think there specifically? Like where yeah. is the artificial intelligence already ahead of human competence? Yeah, maybe we step there two steps backward and uh, can acknowledge that up to only three to five years ago, the experts in these technological fields and the public was very convinced and concerned that robots would take over mm -hmm. and they would take the jobs of warehouse workers and this and that uh, with machines and production robots, which were already right. in the German car industry, developed and used in the 1980s, 90s in these yeah. conveyor belt automated production processes. So that has always been a fear. Uh, and when even the experts up till three to five years ago were anticipating the robots will take the so-called blue collar jobs, the simple worker uh, conveyor belt and uh, you know, like um, packaging, logistics, etc. So and that is still coming. <laughs> Just uh, uh, last night I was actually uh, watching a documentary about uh, Amazon uh, in increasing their fleet of AI robots. Uh, which are uh, working their delivery uh, warehouse jobs and so on. But uh, interesting enough, more at threat than these simple labor blue collar jobs are actually the white collar jobs. So the experts did not anticipate this mm -hmm. fast and strong leap in the more um, knowledge worker uh, context of you no know, um, planning um, and also the creative uh, professions, etc., that was always anticipated to come last because it was uh, foreseen that this will still take a long time for technology to be able to fulfill such tasks. But now it's almost coming the other way that specifically the knowledge workers um, are threatened uh, for their job security. So there's big concerns. And in the mid-long run, they are definitely also reasonable. But I would say in the next three to five years, many jobs are still very safe. Sure, there might be some first replacements happening soon in call centers, for example, customer support, uh, where a lot of it can be done uh, with um, AI voice agents, like the uh, fancy version of Alexa, Siri, just being able to answer all questions, fix all your queries in a customer support context. So there will be some early first job losses in these areas, and also in some areas of creative production here and there. Sure. Thinking about copywriting, text copywriting, production. Copywriting, text writing, exactly. So in those fields, definitely. Um, 
yet this is not the quantity and this in a way mm -hmm. does not yet justify the big fear of job loss. AI will replace me. Uh, over the next three to five years, this is actually not what we can anticipate. The famous saying is not AI will replace you, but other human beings using AI will replace right. you. So you will be outpaced by other humans who are skillfully amplifying their output, the quality and quantity of their work results. And then in this outperforming will be just more efficient, more cost effective. And then if a company has the choice to hire somebody who's super capable of using the latest version of those technological tools, they will much prefer that because that person will deliver double, triple, quadruple the uh, work result as compared to somebody who is resisting and uh, does not want to use But this, this technology. But this is in a way not, um, you know, new. Like anybody who does not want to use email or does not want to use internet or not want to use um, a mobile phone. Um, of course, for tech-shy people, um, it's more difficult. So basically, we can say it's just an extension of um, be being tech-savvy and and yes. keeping up with the latest developments. Exactly. Right? Staying up to date with the latest trends and developments. Exactly. And this we have seen before, as you mentioned, with examples uh, such as uh, email, internet, uh, and other technological revolutions which came over previous decades. Uh, so there's many parallels, of course, um, to such developments. And we can also see it in the psychological reception of the general public. Um, also in the past, there was a lot of fear and concern about the dangers of this and that, uh, any development. But it wasn't as disproportional as it is now, I feel. There is something that I mean, is... The fear? The fear, yeah. The fear by AI is much stronger, triggered, I feel, yes. than by a smartphone. It was by a smartphone. Yeah, the smartphone was also more an incremental change. You know, we already had uh, computers, we already had the internet. Phones, okay, now yeah. it's a mobile internet. This is kind of more foreseeable, predictable, right, right. Yeah, not that big of a leap. Um, but this is also why AI has been uh, called by some of the tech experts like an invention, a development um, as big rather as the internet. So not just as mobile uh, devices, which made a huge leap, but the internet was also a radical change. That's uh, true. Like radical. Like in the old days, okay, telephone and fax. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In German okay. government offices, they are still using the fax, this paper thing. You kind of feed in a paper on one side and the paper comes out the other side. Um, the government in Germany still uses these devices. Um, so there's no, some late adapters which are resistant and then it's kind of like more tangible, something real, which is not just electronic, digital. What if it gets deleted and disappears? So we want to have some paper or even no, like it's still in many offices, like it's common practice that things need to get printed out. Yeah, like right. uh, digital is not kind of good enough. Trustworthy. Like, it's not trustworthy. Like print it and put it into a folder and put it in the shelf. That's kind of like, okay, we got our cabinet here with all the papers. Makes us feel more safe. So, so there is a, a lack, um, a, a resistance to adaptation. So it's very normal. But you mentioned that the fear is now bigger. Um, and in some ways, it is also in a justified way bigger because also the development and the change comes not only fast, not only super fast, but as I was using the term before, breakneck speed. The development is extremely, extremely accelerated. So the progress, the upgrades, the improvements are not coming every year, but they're coming every month. And the point is that the rate, the speed of progress is only accelerating further and further because there's exponential improvements, upgrades in one area, more on the software side, but there's also exponential improvements on the hardware side mm -hmm. and algorithm and human side and different ingredients which are growing. And if those different exponential growth rates come on top of each other, then it just leads to a hyper-inflated, hyper-increased, extremely accelerated development. And then... We have a tendency to be late adapters, no? like 20 years, 30 years later, German government still using fax. Like those, 
progress rates will come so fast that people will get just get outdated and completely old-fashioned in a year or two. Even the people developing those tools. Just yesterday, I was watching an interview um, with uh, Jan Lacun, who is the chief AI and tech scientist in uh, Meta, Facebook, um, Instagram. And uh, he said, even I barely managed to keep up with the development. Same, uh, the Microsoft uh, CTO, same, like, I barely managed to keep track of the progress. So the speed of the development seems to be fearful yeah. or creating sure. fear. It's scary. But sure. perhaps also the fear of delusion, of manipulation, of uh, what is fake, what is truth, what, like, it seems to be getting less clear for us humans to discriminate and i feel that's also a big point where the fear comes from could you talk a little bit about that topic too yeah so the um, question of what is real what is unreal becomes more and more blurry um, because the faking of content becomes more and more easy um, Oh, in the old days, we would have had some fraud around faking a signature or pretending some this or that. Um, then already for quite a few years, we're talking like more than a decade plus, um, humanity already has gotten used to the possibility that photos can be photoshopped. They can be manipulated and changed afterwards. And it's not necessarily so trustworthy, only because on a photo, we kind of got used to it, it could be a fake image. Um, but where this development now goes further is that also video can be manipulated. And up to now, we still feel kind of like, no, it's on video, it's on tape. It's not a tape anymore, but <laughs> it's a digital uh, video footage where we see you did this, you moved here, you did that, it's your face, we got you. Oh, you said uh, that. You oh, you said that, statement. video and audio, yeah. exactly. And in combination, you said that on video. Uh, and then, whatever, conviction in front of court, because obviously you said that. And this is um, no longer useful, because already now the deep fakes are uh, reaching such a quality level that um, it's almost impossible to tell the difference. Definitely not on a first view amateur eye on social media. And that is, of course, the danger that the so-called fake news are spreading like wildfire because people saw it on this post and it's like, wow, and then scandal and then share it. But maybe it's not true. So this has been already also happening for the last years, deep fake um, kind of revenge porn and stuff where like, uh, celebrity politician faces being put uh, on porn movie actors and so on. So it's not that this is completely new. Oh, just thinking of fake news. Fake news, or, yeah. sure, sure. And combining these manipulated uh, footages, be it image, video, audio, combining that with the viral tendency mm -hmm. of the social media algorithms, which are just supercharging uh, the distribution of provocative, scandalous content. Mm. Um, well, even if somebody says like, wow, this cannot be true, comments under it. That supports the algorithm to spread it even further. And then many others think, oh, but they, they don't even read the comments and uh, the text. They just see the image like, whoa. And this has been already used um, over the last years uh, in media uh, and manipulation, propaganda, etc. Uh, for example, um, towards the beginning of the... Ukraine Russian war. Um, the footage appeared uh, that the Russian uh, Prime Minister Zelensky was uh, saying, We are surrendering, we're giving up. Uh, and then it was like, oh, what the, the Ukrainian people are like, Are we really giving up or what? And but it was uh, still pretty obvious to see that it was um, a deep faked, manipulated video. Um, but by now, these things can be done um, in a very convincing, compelling way. What went viral in the U.S. Uh, not so long ago is um, uh, Tom Cruise deep fake, uh, deep Tom Cruise or something, uh, with some you know like talent shows and uh, and in real time. What they demonstrated there was interesting um, that they can manipulate during a stage show in real time um, the facial expression and put another character on top of it. So obviously, there's a lot of trouble coming from that. Uh, Next year, 24, uh, will be one of the biggest election years on the planet with 
I forgot, like more than 2 billion people voting their new uh, government, etc., including in the US, the presidential election. Uh, so there's, of course, serious valid concern that there will be a lot of manipulation, propaganda happening on the social media platforms. And generally speaking, um, no, what it undermines is generally un our understanding of truth. Because usually we have this human uh, bias of kind of, kind of, I only see what I be I only believe what I see. I saw it, then I believe it. And we extended this from real life also into video footage. So, but now we cannot believe that anymore. And it has many, many implications. For example, um, in banks and other institutions where you would, um, for example, confirm your identity on the phone uh, with your voice. So the voice recognition and uh, speech synthesis nowadays with cloning of the voice this is no longer a valid ingredient and can be, of course, also used in criminal fraud and deceiving maneuvers, hoax, phishing, fakes. Of course, there will be a lot of problems, a lot of new criminality. I'm, to be honest, not that worried about it. No, we also got over it uh, with Photoshop. Okay, it's just a Photoshop image. With spam email, the same. It was a problem for a while. Our inboxes got flooded with spam. If you're a Gmail user... When was the last time that you saw an actual spam email? Okay, you got this marketing stuff in your promotion tab. Even that is filtered out already. But spam in Gmail basically doesn't exist anymore. Even if you go to your spam folder, it's empty because it's filtered beforehand. There's no more African princess asking for a million dollar gift and you won in the lottery. It's like you don't even see it anymore. We learned how to deal with it. We developed spam filters. It's, of course, always an... No, like increase and they are of course uh, pressing for labeling that AI generated content needs to be labeled um, but then there will be the hackers and spammers will bypass those filters and it's going to be an it's like the the viruses on computers are hacking it's a constant arms race of upgrading but Burger, I think right now you were um, in the position of the humans are still ahead of technology but I think really a big fear is what if technology takes over? I think this is also yeah. something that is so scary. That's one of the main fears. No? The machines will take over. Um, and we'll come to that in a moment. But a bit like we had the argument before, not AI will replace you at your job, but another human being using AI. The same also in this argument. Not AI will take over and control humanity. Right. But other human beings using AI will take over. And that's in one uh, way, as we discussed, in the productive sector of labor, work, productivity, yeah. etc. But that's also in the area of bad actors. Mm -hmm. Of um, We talked about uh, no, criminality, spam, yeah. hackers, viruses, as well as then um, certain political groups, uh, countries with dictators in the government, etc., etc. So the so-called bad actors, mm -hmm. if they get their hands on AI, and they did already, right? it is already in the hands of evil people. Mm -hmm. And their power will get supercharged because if they upgrade their abilities to utilize and supercharge their influence via AI then this will certainly uh, pose a significant risk for massive trouble on the planet. Right. Um, and it starts with what we just talked about, um, manipulation and propaganda in election campaigns um, no, for yeah. the yeah. Um, US that is already a common phenomenon, even in Germany, that outside countries, actors, hacker groups are influencing the opinion uh, in countries mm. before the election, etc. This is a reality clearly proven. Uh, and that will just get supercharged, but that can get more. Because, of course, then there is possibilities. One of the standard ones, which is feared, is uh, bioengineering. Right. Uh, that the AI could support bad actors to engineer some pathogen, some new virus, some bioweapon, and then releasing that onto another country population, etc. So there uh, definitely serious risks uh, are at stake. And it's to be taken extremely serious. And this is more imminent. This is like mm -hmm. um, in the next two, three, five years, we can have a lot of this trouble uh, on the horizon. So this is definitely also keeping me up at night and is a huge concern of the experts in the field, no doubt. Um, and we could talk much more about that. But as we just do an introductory yeah, overview, yeah. you asked 
about the AI itself taking over. Yes, there is also a, a valid concern and fear in that direction. And some of the experts who even uh, kind of co-created this whole field of machine learning and artificial intelligence, uh, very famous in the media these days is Jeffrey Hinton, mm -hmm. uh, who is one of the researching founders in the field and who worked then at Google for many years in the uh, previous recent history. And he left Google to, free, uh, to speak up freely uh, about the dangers of AI. Not he, that he was speaking specifically against Google. He just wanted to express his concerns about the field which he founded himself. And one of his uh, collaborators, uh, Joshua Bengio, is joining him in that um, expression of concern, etc. Um, the field is split. Um, my rough estimation would be that around a third of the AI experts and scientists um, are concerned to very concerned about problematic developments. Um, and then it's always the question, you know, how much is the probability? How likely it right, is right. that the machine takes over? And then, no, is it the 10% probability? Well, that's huge. But even if it's a 5% possibility, should we continue developing that? Or, as it was the call, something like uh, uh, February 2023, um, was an open letter to stop, to pause the development of AI. Let's slow down. Let's first get clear uh, because we don't want to develop something which even has a 5% or even a 1% possibility right. of uh, like being a serious threat to humanity. So there's definitely valid concerns around that, no doubt, uh, which shouldn't be ignored or just kind of in a... Uh, enthusiastic tech optimism just ignored and kind of like, yeah, it will be all fine because things can turn negative and rogue get problematic. Um, so there are actual dangers about that. But um, this idea of uh, let's stop that is uh, probably an idea that uh, is an impossibility, isn't it? Yeah, complete illusion. And in a way, most of the people who signed the letter also knew that this stopping of the development for half a year, as it was suggested uh, back then, um, is completely unrealistic uh, because it's in many ways an arms race, both on the corporate level, and one can so clearly see it how the Silicon Valley tech companies and their Seattle friends with uh, Amazon, AWS and Microsoft, um, how the US tech companies and the Chinese tech companies and all tech companies around the world are just in a massive arms race of investing billions and billions and billions of no dollars. No one would slow down. No, no, no one would just in any way even consider any. It's right, like the complete right. opposite. Everybody goes like not full throttle, but quadruple throttle, like all four feet on the gas pedal to go as strong as possible to not miss out in this uh, huge potential right. um, and productivity gain and uh, profits which uh, will inevitably come uh, from this development. So on the corporate level, complete fantasy that they would yeah. start. Um, and then on a the government level also, because the mm. countries are also at an arms race, right. uh, as they have been in the military field uh, for decades and centuries. Um, also in the technological field, uh, the governments of the countries are trying to push ahead. The most prominent obvious one is of course US against China, where the main stakes are at play with Taiwan in the center of it, where the huge risk uh, bomb lies. So um, the prominent countries, but then it's of course also European Union, they came with their AI Act, which is a bit more conservative, slowing things down. The US regulations a bit more liberal, but then of course at least keeping China in check. And there's a whole global arms race. The Middle East is going strong. Um, there's huge in, uh, investments there in UAE, Saudi Arabia. Falcon is an open source model, which mm -hmm. they develop there. They go strong into the field. And it's a whole um, investment show and just everybody tries to outperform each other. So there's no way of slowing down in any way. Uh, so it's just a question of the regulation. But there's the main con concern and problem that governments, politics around the globe is notoriously bad at quickly implementing regulations which match the latest technological development. We've seen that over the last decades. The governments are way, way, way too slow. And as we talked before about this extreme acceleration of this AI field at the moment, almost completely hopeless. So and then we rely on self-regulation of the corporations. While the governments go also full speed in uh, autonomous weapon systems and AI for military. 
and they're also not going to slow down and regulate themselves because like China's also not regulating themselves. So let's go strong as well. And like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Mm. we're in for big waves, big trouble over the next five to 10 years. It's going to be extremely disruptive. Yes. Yes. So buckle up, uh, stay calm, learn how to take a deep breath and stay centered in the confrontation with this not only storm, but it's a cyclone, it's a hurricane which is upon us, which is already happening. And you maybe have only seen some headlines and some of the kind of at the horizon, some things like, ah, oh, oh, this AI thing, oh yeah, I worry about this. But the wave, the storm, the tsunami will come big time. In the next two, three, five years, we will barely recognize our daily way of using technology it's mm. about to be completely turned upside down so tell us a little bit more about the potential and the benefits like there must be also gold in it right mm. otherwise um, it would not be such a technological race that nobody wants to lose so i'd like to get a little bit of uh input on the different fields uh, of benefits mm. of the development. Um, it's available to everyone, you see, like basically all the bad actors can use AI in whichever way they want to, but isn't the potential also that it's actually accessible potentially if you are educating yourself to everyone? Exactly, that's the point. It's uh, more or less freely accessible. And of course, the majority of human beings on this planet are fortunately not bad actors, but more or less good actors, neutral actors, or even very benevolent beings who are having very pure intentions and want to not only support their own growth, development, well-being, but also of their families, communities, and cultures. Um, so there's huge potential Uh, in giving access to this powerful technology to the majority of humanity. So the same as we have already seen over the last years and decades uh, with the internet being accessible also in developing so-called third world countries, yeah. um, where they even at some points were, of it, uh, were at advantage in the development. Uh, for example, in industrial countries, we have this old legacy system of uh, the phone lines to transmit the signal of the internet, old copper lines in Germany still being used ultra slow, uh, which in many African countries, these steps were skipped of infrastructure and they directly went to high speed internet and everybody directly had a smartphone. They didn't need to have landline phones and have all these wasted investments into this old technology. Right. So this already gave huge, in, um, in a way, possibilities uh, for people in developing countries to also have access to all the knowledge of humanity as the promise of the internet in general and organizations like Wikipedia and companies like Google programmatically is giving access to the knowledge of humanity to everyone. That's a huge, huge possibility um, because education already in that uh, field of the internet was not limited anymore. And then with the wave of COVID, more and more home study, the universities putting their courses online and making them accessible frequently even for free. Uh, you can take Harvard and Oxford classes for free in the internet. We put our yoga education online and made a lot of it also in this YouTube channel, etc., accessible for free. So education is very much already possible uh, for all people, not for all, but uh, for a growing Uh, Number, proportion yeah. of the human population around the globe. That has been the history over the last years and decades. But now this gets supercharged with the AI technology because what we can now have is a personalized tutor, an individualized teacher who really takes each and every student by the hand and gives full possibility to every student to have access to the best quality knowledge and didactical guidance. So one of the huge potentials of AI is in education, where it's not only the knowledge is available, but it's a one-on-one -on -one guide, a tutor, a mentor, a teacher, a coach, who 
can get to know the student better and better. Ah, you are a visual learner. Ah, you're excited about this and that field in your hobby, in your free time, whatever. As a kid, you like whatever, race cars. You like this, you like that. Then let me explain you this mathematical problem, which you uh, would like to understand, not in an abstract way, but with a race car example. Like, whatever, there's two race cars on the track. Now a third one enters, and this and then. Now how many? And you know, making it relatable. That's just a, a small anecdotal example to show how it can be uh, personalized, the educational journey. So it will, in a very radical way, uh, have the potential to revolutionize education. Of course, the legacy, the traditional government school systems will be, as always, very slow to adapt. We've seen that already with past technologies. Uh, so there will be, of course, resistance, hesitation, delay, late adaption, of course. But um, again, the people in the developing countries, they anyhow don't have access to quality education in their schools. So they waste less time there and they just do their own personal education and they have the same access to advanced technology and learning methods. But as will that be free programs or will that be copyrighted, expensive programs for privileged no, people? No, no, no. Already now, um, the majority of the AI technology is accessible completely for free. And who's one of the, in the educational field, market leaders in the digital education uh, is called Khan Academy, K-H-A-N. Uh, and they are one of the leaders in online education already over the last years. And then they early on jumped on the AI train and developed a tool called Canmigo, a personalized AI tutor, um, giving access to school education. Uh, it's, um, I think at the moment, standard would be on a donation of something like $20 per month, which of course for some families in Africa will be unrealistic. Um, yet, I'm convinced that they have uh, scholarship programs, access to communities. They make agreements with government school districts. They provide X licenses, access rights for free and so on. There's a lot of humanitarian and emancipatory movements who are exactly pushing for that. Who's going extremely strong in the field is um, Imad Mostak, who is uh, the founder of Stability, a um, famous company in the more open source approach to artificial intelligence. Um, famous models are the stable diffusion image generator, but they go more and more into exactly bringing that knowledge, that educational possibility, bring those tools in the hands of the underprivileged people for free. And they gather the money from the uh, international uh, organizations, from the government, from the um, whatever, be it internationally, International Monetary Fund or United Nations uh, educational organizations, etc. So they gather some millions from those organizations. They build the system. They make it, make it accessible in the developing countries. This is very much um, happening the, um, in the preparation. And over the last years, it will roll out big time. So this will be, in, in many ways, a leveling out of um, you know, the privilege of education. You remember, Kirsten, we were traveling 25 years ago in Latin America. We were confronted with the poverty there. And uh, we saw how kids were working as 10-year-old, 8-year-old kids. They were earning some extra jobs, some money to go to a school to educate themselves. And we saw like, whoa, they put so much effort to just learn reading and writing and they need to work so hard to pay their school fees, even though they are just eight year old kids. It was extremely shocking. And we understood like, wow, education is such a privilege. Let's go back to Germany and use that benefit of uh, educating ourselves in university there. And back then it was almost free for years to study in university. I, I even received money from the government. That's how privileged a European country can be. Um, so we had that privilege, amazing, and we made use of it. We saw it and we benefited so much from it. But this discrepancy, this massive difference will in five, ten years be by far less. Hmm. It still will have tendencies and sure, it's not, and I'm not kind of blue eyed uh, pink elephants like, oh, in three years, everybody will have access and everybody will be as smart as everybody. No, not like this, but still, the access will be much more easily possible Beautiful. with the AI technologies. And it's very inspiring, very yeah. inspiring. Yeah. And it's not only for poor countries, but also for underprivileged people yeah. in uh, rich countries, yeah. of course. Yeah. Beautiful. So that's just one example education. 
Um, creativity, you said earlier that surprisingly the field of creativity uh, in the work field is harder hit by the AI development than the blue workers. So what, what can I, AI really do for us? What's the potential? Where are we with the development and the creative field? Yeah, so starting with the photo generation. Uh, so the most powerful tool around is Mid Journey. Uh, I just before mentioned uh, Stable Diffusion by Stability, um, but also DALI 3 by OpenAI and other image generators, as well as, of course, the standard platforms such as uh, Adobe and their Photoshop, Adobe Fireflies with generative fill, etc., and many others in the video field, etc. All those uh, Old, established, strong players try to keep up and there's many new players coming into the field which provide amazing possibilities for image generation and full creative expression on based on very simple, plain text prompts. If you haven't tried it, definitely uh, explore, explore, experiment, give it a try. Um, it gives non-creative, non-artistic people like me the tools to express themselves. And have ideas, dreams, fantasies, visualizations, which I cannot even visualize in my limited, narrow-minded, creative brain. I just have some idea and I write my words, type them down. And there it is. And then, okay, a bit more like this. And a bit more like this. And soon it will be not with text prompts, but with voice prompts. And you just direct like, ah, no, I meant uh, to have the woman on the left side, the man on the right, and uh, she should wear a blue jacket, not a green jacket. And it's like, <laughs> ah, and it changes, and it changes, and anything. You know, like, and they shouldn't stand on the moon, on the Mars. And <laughs> now, okay. And, but the moon is on the horizon in the background. And on the right side, there's a right, spaceship. Right, and right. images just get generated, and it's photorealistic quality. Just this morning, I was looking again at some uh, new images. I could barely see the difference if it's a uh, uh, real human being uh, of a portrait or uh, if it's uh, artificially generated. You can basically not see the difference mm. anymore. Mm. So that on the just image generation, video generation will completely turn around. Yeah. Um, that's also why not only the writers, but also the creative um, artists are on the barricades because they fear about their future. Even Hollywood artists, etc., have been protesting because they worry, rightly so, to get cloned. And the movie production in the future will be not only that, okay, it's kind of the Hollywood studio generates the actor and there's not even a real actor moving anymore. Uh, already in the past years and decades, uh, the movies, the background of the movies was almost exclusively generated uh, by uh, computers, um, no real sets anymore, but all generated, uh, Avatar and famous movies in the field. Um, but the actors themselves will be cloned and replaced, so no more actors acting. That's the basic first step, but not soon after, what it will be actually is, in a way, view on demand. You give the storyline of the movie and it will be generated on demand. You say, ah, tonight I want to watch a movie which uh, deals uh, with the French Revolution. Um, but I only have uh, 40 minutes time. So keep it short, please. And um, it should be also uh, a love story, of course, uh, a romance. I like that. But not just this cheesy love story. Make it also a bit of a thriller into it. I, I want to get entertained as well. should be some action as well. Um, and... Uh, Make sure that uh, some of the main actors are, I don't know, whatever you want, your favorite actor. You, you choose your selection of actors. And there it goes. And this will be a reality in latest five years. Latest five years video on demand. And it goes so far, I was just listening to some experts in the field, that it would even be adapted because the, your personal AI assistant will know you so well that kind of like, ah, You had a bit of a stressful day. I would suggest that tonight's movie is a bit more of a calming, relaxing one. And it will be adapted to that. And even a few years later, that it changes on the go. It's not pre-generated on your initial <laughs> prompt, but you have it more like a computer game. The, the, the separation between a computer game and the movie will fade and you will be just kind of like, no, 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 go back. Let him win this fight. And she falls in love with this guy. Now, let's continue the movie as I want it. 
this is the gen the future of uh, oh. of entertainment in the next five to ten years. Mm. So radical changes on the creative field. We cannot even imagine what it means. Um, right. That's entertainment. That's fun. Um, that's exciting. But maybe much more important in the area of benefits uh, are fields like medicine and health, for example. Yeah, right. Uh, so discovering right. new medicines uh, which can cure diseases, <whistles> increase longevity, lifespan and health span. There mm. we're talking. And there is huge progress being made outside of the large language models that we just talked about. Um, at the forefront there, the previously mentioned uh, Google DeepMind, where I talked about the mm. AlphaGo chess yeah, uh, yeah. game engine there. Um, what they uh, over the last years developed is the protein folding by AI. It's a mm -hmm. kind of predicting and generating uh, protein molecules at will. So not only analyzing, but creating proteins uh, for uh, discoveries, developments, inventions, etc. So this is very much at the forefront in the biological um, gene and substance development etc and there's huge progress being made there huge potential in that but it continues in the field of medicine uh, already now uh, the ai technology is more capable in uh, detecting uh, certain irregularities in um, x-ray scans and mri scans mm -hmm. uh, seeing tumors uh, and other irregularities in the tissue Uh, with a better success rate than doctors with years and decades of experience. Oh. So also there, huh? mm -hmm. not doctors will be replaced, but doctors using the AI, who will you trust? Huh? If, right. you, if your doctor uses AI and AI is clearly proven to be better at detecting and reading your MRI scan, of course you would also want to have a doctor mm -hmm. who uses that technology who, to be on the safe side and together in the combination And when the interface is managed well, if the doctor knows very well how to use this right. truly capable, user-friendly, interactive AI system, uh, then together the progress is huge. It continues in so many other fields of science, of uh, aerodynamics, shapes, and you know, with 3D printing, etc., etc., You name it. Um, one of the biggest frontiers, last but not least to mention, is um, the energy problem. Mm -hmm. um, one of the biggest hopes there is um, the nuclear fusion, which is, uh, as compared to the nuclear en uh, power plants, nuclear energy, which is having so many problems on the radioactive um, substances coming out of it, the nuclear fusion promises to have none of those catches, but all the benefits of abundant, endless energy. Mm -hmm. If we solve the energy problem, And AI definitely can contribute to solving that faster than we otherwise would somehow figure it mm. out. If we figure out the energy problem and figure out that sooner with AI, it will make the whole difference. Because if we have abundant energy at a very low cost without polluting the environment, yeah. then we don't even have a water problem anymore. Right. Because with energy, you can turn salt water into drinking water. And then yeah. where's the lack of water on the planet? <laughs> we have endless oceans. There's enough water. It's just yeah. salt water. This is the problem we have. Yeah. If you have energy, abundant, free, clean energy, then no more water problem. If we have water, then we can grow food in all the dry areas and deserts. Mm. Then we don't have a food problem anymore. <whistles> If you see right, that potential, right. then you understand why they invest billions and billions right, into this right. technology. Because whoever wins that race can change the planet. Yeah, wow. big potential. Gigantic. Big potential. The whole AI, it is artificial intelligence, intelligence that is the frequency of the mind. Um, the mind is only one frequency that we operate with. There's the emotions as well. There is sensations. There is in conversation, isn't it that 80% of a conversation is through body language and only actually 20% uh, of it through words and mind? So yeah, uh, where... Accurate, it's not, yeah. uh, not only body language, but it's uh, 20%, roughly speaking, is the words, the message, yeah. the, what you say. Uh, the 80% are the how you say it. Not only the body mm -hmm. language, but also the mimics in the face. Uh, and the tone of yeah, the voice. Right, right. So, can 
intelligence ever operate on this level of emotional intelligence like is the human spectrum is not just the mental frequency i wonder uh where are or is there a possibility that other frequencies will be included in the spectrum of this artificial intelligence because at the moment it is the mind level um where are we at when it comes to this different frequencies of operation of mm. humans at the moment as you say the artificial intelligence is very strongly limited to the mental sphere the intellectual knowledge the facts um because it is trained on text almost exclusively it's trained on written human knowledge which is more or less focused on knowledge facts and information intellectual data uh sure of course a lot of the texts are also having emotional charges and there can be love stories so the text talks about emotions and this is also why the ai can um the large language models uh can very well also mimic emotion so because they are trained on this uh emotional expressivity uh of adjectives and attributes from human written text so they have the um strong ability to verbalize emotions in a text if you tell chatgpt or google bard gemini or uh, anthropic claude or whichever large language model like <clears throat> meta llama or whichever one you're using um if you tell it to write in this or that way express this emotion in that love story scenario and so on it will do very well with that and follow the instructions very precisely and be very convincing and compelling in that so then the tendency and danger is is that we do what is called anthropomorphizing the ai so then first of all we start talking about uh he answered like that she it it the ai um we make a person out of it because we can really be in conversation with <clears throat> that large language model and it seems very compelling that it really picks up on our tone it literally is made also uh, if you use it you will see uh, that it uh, uses a famous psychological communication tool which is called mirroring uh, yeah, it repeats uh, what you said and that makes us as humans being understood ah so are you saying that this and that or so yes i will follow your instructions to create a text which is very compassionate and heart opening and i really understand how important that is for you that uh i give an answer mm -hmm. which is very aligned with you, with your preferences of this and that so it just repeats what you were saying and it's like i noticed it in myself when i uh, when i interact with it it's like like yeah exactly like you got me you understood <laughs> so it creates this this one <laughs> good companion good companion it's like a good friend and it's like uh, such an obedient servant and then like i, I apologize that i uh, misunderstood you and so on and uh, it's very compelling in this way and then we have the tendency uh, as mentioned to anthropomorphize uh, meaning we make it a human uh, mm. it becomes a companion it becomes a friend and then we project onto it because it mimics the emotion so well we kind of get a sense that it understands us and that it also understands our emotions oh, i understand that you feel a bit angry and upset i'm sorry that i uh, gave the wrong answer it's like yeah exactly <laughs> like, so we feel heard seen and understood and and then we assume already now that the ai does understand and feel the emotions it really gets me it really uh, gets my point and in some ways it does but in most ways it doesn't it's just mimicking it's just pretending and it's very very sophisticated in mocking in right. making it up in kind of making us believe that it is understanding up to now it doesn't really really understand on a human level and it doesn't definitely have an emotional sense a sentiment and then you no know, like an experience as we have it tangible hands on it just doesn't um, is there a prediction that this will come yes the, it is, it's not only a prediction but uh first of all the mocking gets better and better already now right. it's like basically human level yeah. it's the famous uh turing test actually uh, which has been proposed decades ago and is by now more or less reached 
that when you communicate with the AI for an extended period of time, that you cannot be sure if it's a human being or a machine. And you have a conversation with it, and already now, we're basically at the break-even point. That you cannot be sure, is it an AI or is it a human uh -huh. who's chatting back, uh, typing on the other side. Right, right. So, right. this is famous Turing test. So, already now, it's almost breaking even in many areas of human knowledge, conversation, mm -hmm. etc. Like, we're talking in frequent, like, on the knowledge side, we're talking uh, the famous bar exam and other... Um, certificates and mm -hmm. tests where professional university graduate level knowledge and skill set is evaluated in many of those medical tests and judicial lawyer tests and you name it. Uh, in many of them, we're already kind of at a high school university level break even. So on that level, no doubt this will continue to go through the roof, through the roof, and it will get even better than humans in very short period of time. On the emotional level, it's already also mocking it pretty well, and it might go a little bit slower, um, but even there in the mocking will continue similar speed. But the question is, when does it actually get sentient itself? Yeah. And this will be difficult also for us to evaluate because right. it will get so good at mocking that we cannot tell the difference anymore. Mm -hmm. And I give you a few headlines how it will get better at mocking. Already now it does the plain kind of text to text. It picks up your adjectives, your vocabulary, and does what is called a sentiment analysis. Mm -hmm. uh, it really picks up the tone, how you're writing, and responds accordingly. So on the text word, verbal level, it already works, typed. Um, what they are working on with uh, Big Momentum, one of the leading companies is Hume, H-U-M-E, um, which are working on, in a way, emotional recognition, uh, detection of human emotions. And they do this both via the tone of the voice and the mimic facial expressions. And combining those together, and they do a huge, huge research studies with not thousands, but tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of human evaluators, which label, uh, they, they show them a photo, and then, okay, what emotion is expressed in this mimic? And then they uh, tick among 50 emotions, uh, a little bit of this, a little bit of that, and here, and so on. So they train uh, with uh, what is called um, reinforcement learning with human feedback, uh, RLHF. Um, they train the AI on understanding. What does this mean? What does that mean? This if this cheek goes up a bit like this, it shows that and all the muscles and they map it and the tone of the voice and so on. And it's going to be advanced forms of this sentiment analysis, uh, which is already working okay-ish. It's very early days, but they go with full force. And um, two years, three years in, uh, we'll definitely also have this mocking of emotional connection that we cannot anymore recognize if it is my best friend or an, my AI companion. Wow, what a development, what a vast field um, with so much potential, but also really serious, um, serious dangers involved. Um, I'm really happy that you were sharing all your knowledge that you acquired over the years in the field today in this podcast. Um, wonderful. I really hope that this was informative for you and that uh, you could learn about it and perhaps also um, giving a bit more of a realistic perspective onto the field and knowing what we talk about when we talk about AI, artificial intelligence, and the spectrum of the development. Thank you, Burkhardt, for sharing today all that you know about oh, AI. It was just the tip of the iceberg, so we the just start. got started <laughs> and uh, tipped on some of the headlines. Um, so I feel we should continue this conversation and uh, yeah, yeah. dive deeper also in the implications. Right. Okay, what does that mean? What right, can we do right, as right. yogis about that? How do we position ourselves in relation to this many new form follow intelligence up questions, many follow-up questions to come but for today we are closing this was wisdom in motion with the akasha family keep on shining in the spirit of yoga see you soon